our scripture reading for this second Sunday in the season of Pentecost is taken from the gospel lesson that is recorded for this particular Sunday. It's Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. This is one of the very few times in, in scripture that Jesus talks about the quality of faith, that this person has a great faith or, or not such great faith. In our sermon this morning, we'll talk about the fact that it's not the quality of faith that saves, it's faith that saves, but it is sure nice to have that greater faith when you're going through the troubles of this life. We read from, again, Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. When Jesus had finished saying all of this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am, am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. This is the word of our Lord. Grace and mercy and peace all belong to you through the merits of Jesus Christ, God's Son and our Savior. Our text for this morning is the only lesson that was in the bulletin. It's Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. And it kind of begins a three-Sunday section of, of Gospels that talk about the qualities of faith and, and, and what faith looks like in the heart of a Christian. Today we'll see that the quality of faith here is based on its humility and its trust on Jesus. Dear brothers and dear sisters in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I'll ask you that question. How, how is your faith right now in your life? If a doctor came in and asked you like they do, <clears throat> or a nurse comes in and says, how is your pain, and you had to rate it on a scale of 1 to 10, you say, well, my pain is about a 6, but I can see it, it's getting worse. How would you rate your faith? Would you give it a, a 5 right in the, the middle, the average of the spiritual faith? Would you put it, nah, it's kind of struggling sometimes, or would you put it over by an 8 or a 9? You know what, my life is good, I've got no problems, my faith seems to be serving me very well. Here's a faith test that I've heard before, that I've, I've, I've asked people sometimes. If, if you want to know whether your faith is on that faith spectrum, here's a couple of questions you can ask yourself. Do you trust that God is going to take care of you completely? And that it doesn't depend on you in your life so that that takes place. Sometimes we, we trust that God will take care of us, yes, but we say, well, but it's going to be up to me to do it all. No, do you trust that God will take care of every aspect of your life? And it doesn't depend on you to help him at all. Have you conquered all of your worries is another question. Nothing bothers you anymore. Nothing keeps you up at night. All your worries have just kind of vanished in thin air. Do you trust that your marriage is a blessing? Same blessing as it was on the day that you got married. Do you trust that? That's a faith question as well. Do you talk about your faith to other people? Are, are, are you content when your faith goes, and your prayers, I should say, go unanswered sometimes? You, you're, you're asking God for this specific thing, and it doesn't seem that he is offering you any kind of answer whatsoever. Do you just trust and you're content when God doesn't seem to answer your prayers? Or, or, or maybe he's telling you with his, his silence, 
no is the answer to your question right then and there. Is your life going as planned? Or would you like to take that wheel back from the Lord and say, Lord, jump in the back seat. I'm going to drive from now on. Those, those are questions that can kind of gauge your, your spiritual faith. This is a, 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 my faith is really, really well. It's, it's being fed regularly. I don't have any worries. <clears throat> I do trust that God is going to take care of me. My marriage is a blessing. My children are a blessing. I, I don't have to worry about anything. Or is it somewhere on the lower end of that spectrum? If you answered all those questions with a confident yes, then, then I would say I would be a, kind of jealous of your faith. Because I don't think too many people could answer yes to every single one of those questions. If you answered not with a a, a yes or a confident yes, take heart because you've got a faith like most other people. And, and, And remember what Jesus says in scripture. It's not your great faith that saves you. It's not because you have a faith that is a 7 to a 10 on that faith spectrum. It's because you have faith. The Holy Spirit has created faith in Jesus Christ in your heart. Faith saves. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe, in other words, doesn't have any faith, that's the one that's going to be condemned. So today we are thankful, and we can be thankful, for the faith that the Holy Spirit has planted in us. Baptism, normally, the Holy Spirit works through baptism to plant that faith in you. And from that point on to the day that you die, God gets you through life. And he gives you the the wherewithal to make it through life. Most importantly, he gives you the object of your faith, that is Jesus, who gets you to the next life. We, we, We appreciate the fact that the Holy Spirit has created faith in our hearts. That said, however... Wouldn't it be nice to have a greater faith than we do? Wouldn't it be nice to have, if I'm, if I'm going along with, I've got a, a faith that is carrying me along. Yes, a faith, Jesus, is the object. But it would be so nice to have a, a seven or a nine on that faith spectrum so that I can sleep better at night. So my, so my faith is more resilient against all the, the attacks of Satan, the temptations, the, the things that the world throws at me, the things that my own sinful nature throws at me, wouldn't it be nice to have a faith that says, you know what, I don't care about any of those things. They're not going to bother me because my faith is rooted in Christ Jesus, my Savior. And nothing is going to deter me at all. That's the kind of faith that we're looking for. And, and, and that's the kind of faith that we just sang about. Increase our faith, dear Savior. Or in the last hymn that we're going to sing at the end of today's worship service, we're going to say, Lord, give us such a faith as this. And then it lists a laundry list of troubles that when this comes, it'll be fine. When this comes, it'll be fine. When this happens, you will be fine as well. That's what we're asking our Savior for. Jesus does that. We've got pretty good precedent. One, one time he talked about the quality of faith in a negative way. <clears throat> he, was, he had gone back to his, his hometown of Nazareth, and he looked at the people, and they looked at him, and they said, isn't just this the carpenter's son? And it said that they didn't have faith, they didn't put their faith in him, and Jesus, were quoted, Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith, even knowing that he was the Savior. But there's two times in the Bible, in the Gospels, where we, are, we hear from God's word that Jesus was amazed at their great faith. One was a time when a demon-possessed daughter's mother came to Jesus and she was so broken over her daughter's demon possession that, he, that she pleaded with Jesus, please, take a look at my little girl. Please, save her. And, and Jesus seemed to put her off for a little bit. And he talked about the the... the, the the Jewish people, the nation, the chosen nation of God, and, and you are not of the Jewish nation. And then she responded with, but even the dogs get some crumbs that fall from the master's table. And then Jesus looked at her and said, you have some great faith. And he healed her daughter. But then the other time is what we have in our text for this morning. Not only does Jesus say that this centurion's faith was great, but it tells us that Jesus was amazed at his faith, which amazes me and, and, and should amaze anybody who reads kinds of verses like that, that true God, Jesus Christ, 
would be amazed at a human being's faith. That's amazing. Today we're going to take a look and kind of borrow from that last hymn <clears throat> or the hymn before us that we just sang and, and use that as, a, as, a, as our prayer. Lord, give us such a faith as this. And, and we'll take a look at the centurion's faith. First, we're going to see that it was a humble faith, a faith that did not look to itself at all. And then we'll see that it's a faith that has its object as Jesus Christ and only Jesus Christ. You look at these verses, you read these verses, and the main character besides Jesus, of course, is this centurion. He's never named. We don't know too much about him, but the Bible does give us a little bit of a description about him and what kind of a man he was. And it's actually a positive description, which you wouldn't expect, especially since the Jewish people and the Romans, they did not have that greatest of relationships. Remember, the Romans were occupying they were an occupying nation in the Jewish homeland. And, and so they had people ruling over them that were not of their own people. They, they, they didn't especially like the fact that they had some ruler from some foreign land in Italy, Rome. That was their ruler. And, and so we see a lot of conflict between the Jewish people and the Romans typically. But not here. Not in this relationship this centurion evidently had been given the territory of Capernaum. And, and, and that was kind of Jesus' base of operations for the majority of his ministry. And evidently, this centurion had a really good relationship with the people of Capernaum. As a matter of fact, when, when, when the Jewish leaders found out that this centurion had a sick servant... They went to Jesus and they said, this man deserves to have you come to him and heal his servant. Why? Because he loves our people. This Roman centurion loves the Jewish people here in Capernaum. In fact, how much did he love them? He built them a synagogue. He didn't have to do that. It was out of his own pocket. But yet he decided that out of his own love for what God had done for him, he was going to give to these people a synagogue. And, and so there was a really good relationship between this Roman centurion and these people from Capernaum. As a matter of fact, you would probably enjoy him if he came into our church as a new member. You read in the bulletin, welcome to this new member. And, and you get to know this new member. And he's the guy, the guy that comes into a worship house of worship for the first time and hears God's good news for the first time. And he says, that's amazing that Jesus has taken me off the path to hell and put me on the path to heaven, even knowing who I am and what I am and what I do and what I say. And Jesus is going to take me to heaven someday. He's forgiven all of my sins. And he would say that that is such an amazing thing that God has done for him that he's going to do anything that he could possibly do for his Savior. So he will volunteer in this congregation. He will do anything that if, if, if there's a call out in the bulletin, we need people on this particular day, that would be the first person to sign up. He'd be the perfect member in a congregation. And when I say that, he would say, there's a mission opportunity? How, how much is it going to cost us? We, we need a new church? How much does it cost? And, and, and when he finds out it's $2 million, he would take out his check and say, you know something, I don't need this all for my retirement. I'm going to write out a check for $2 million. And that's exactly what this man did. He wrote out a check from his own resources for a brand new synagogue at Capernaum. God's love had changed him. Somewhere along the way, he had heard about the fact that God came to save sinners, and he was one of them, and he wanted to thank God for it. He loved his Savior. He loved the people at Capernaum at this particular synagogue, and he showed it in his life. That said, however, he had a problem. And it was a problem that not only all of his authority could help him with, all of his money could not help him with either. And, and that happens sometimes, right? You, you think that millionaires, they have no problems whatsoever. Ask a millionaire if the money can save his marriage that is unraveling before his eyes. Can money save an unraveling marriage? 
ask a, a CEO millionaire of a, of a wonderful company if his money is going to save his dying loved one who is sitting in that hospital bed. His money is not going to do anything. There are certain things that are completely out of our control, and we have to trust in God completely. And that's what this centurion did. <clears throat> he had a problem. And his problem was that one of his servants, and, and when, when, when I say servant, that kind of makes it sound like, well, it's just a servant, just a slave. No, it says he valued him highly. It was almost as if it was one of his own children was sick unto death. He was on his deathbed. That was his problem. And when he realized his problem and realized that Jesus was in the vicinity, he says, Jesus can do something about this problem. So he sent some people to Jesus. And the Jewish leaders come to him and they say, this is this, is this man, he's helped us wonderfully with our synagogue. He's been a great part of the congregation here. Can you help him? Can you save or can you do something about his servant? And what did they add? This man deserves to have these things done for him because he is such a deserving man. What he's done is so appreciated. He deserves, if there's anybody that deserves to have a, a break in life, it was this centurion. Now, now it's important to note that that centurion never said that. He was not bragging himself up. He was not the one that was saying, you know, Lord, if there's anybody that deserves a break, it's me. This is what I've done, and, and gives the laundry list of all the things that he had done to deserve it. He had the opposite opinion of himself. How, how do we know that? Because as Jesus was traveling on the way to visit his servant, his sick servant, then the centurion said, you know something, I don't even deserve him to come to my house. So he sent a delegation of his friends back to Jesus and said, he doesn't, he's saying he doesn't deserve to have you come under his roof, but... If you do say the word, he trusts that he will be healed. What, what are the words? This is the message. Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But just say the word, and my servant will be healed. That centurion knew what we need to be reminded of every single day. That if, there, if there's ever a day that you think that you deserve this from God, that you've got it coming from God, that because of your church attendance or your church giving or anything that you do for the church or what God has given you in this life, that you deserve a pat on the back from our God, it's wrong. Do we deserve anything from our Savior do we deserve the least of anything that he has given us? How could Jesus have loved us so much? We don't know because there's nothing in us that deserves his love. How could he love me so much? Ask yourself that question because you know your life. You, you know your sins. You know your thoughts. And, and yet Jesus unbelievably loves you and he loves me. A humble faith realizes that it is never deserving from God. A humble faith realizes that we are completely unworthy before God. Lord, give us a faith like this centurion, this humble, trusting in you alone kind of faith that says, I don't deserve this, but I'm going to ask you anyways. And then give us a faith which trusts completely in, not itself, like, I have such a great faith. No, I have a faith in my Savior, Jesus Christ. It's got an object. And that's the wonderful thing about a Christian faith that has an object. It's not just faith for faith's sake. I've got faith that can move a mountain. Where, what is this faith based on? Well, it's just a faith that is inside me. No, there's no such thing. A faith, a true faith, a saving faith, trusts in Jesus alone for this life and especially for the next life. That, that's what we see in the world, don't we? When you got in your car this morning, what did you have faith in? That when you turned the key, it was going to start and that it would get you to the church. When you sat down in the pews for the first time this morning, what did you have faith in? You had faith that those pews were going to hold you and keep you from sitting on the, on the floor. We have faith in all kinds of things in our life this day. But when it comes to saving faith, 
And when it comes to a faith that is going to put us in heaven someday, the object of that faith is what is important. The object of that centurion's faith was a person, and it was Jesus Christ. As far as we know, that centurion never ever even met Jesus, never even had a face-to-face -face conversation with Jesus, because we're not told that he did in our text or in the Gospel from Matthew chapter 8. What we do know is he trusted in Jesus' promises. And he trusted in what Jesus had accomplished in him. He trusted that he had a problem and that Jesus had the power and he had the authority and he had the will to help him with his problem. And that's what great faith does. He was amazed at this man's faith because it trusted in his Savior. I don't know if you've ever done this to a child. <clears throat> Actually, my, my daughter likes doing this to the dog once in a while. You put a, a, a blindfold on his or her eyes and then you take him into an unfamiliar space and then you just let him go. Now, 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 what is that person going to do? What is that child going to do? Maybe even a, a, a grown-up person would be an even better example. A grown-up person, if they're not in a if they're not in a familiar space, they're going to be reaching out with their arms and they're going to be treading very slowly and very carefully, because they don't know what is going to be in front of them. You don't feel comfortable in that kind of a setting. If, however, someone takes your hand and says, "I will lead you to where you want to go," then it's okay. Then that person, you trust in that person, you trust in that person's words, you trust in that person's care and love for you. That's what our relationship is with our Savior. In this world by ourselves, you have to tread very, very slowly and lightly because we don't know where to go on our own. But Jesus says, take my hand and I will lead you through the obstacles of this world and all the way to heaven someday. That's what St. Paul wrote when he says, we walk by faith and not by sight. We can use our eyes, but your eyes don't help you when it comes to the spiritual world. The, 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 the hymn writer put it well when he said this, Savior, I follow on guided by thee, seeing not yet the hand that leadeth me. Lord, I trust that you will guide me, even though I can't see the way myself. Lord, grant us such a faith as this, as we're going to sing in the next hymn, or the last hymn at the end of the service. Give me a humble faith. Knock it down sometimes when it has a temptation to trust in its own or in myself. Give me a humble faith that trusts alone in you. That's a great faith. Amen. The peace of God, which goes beyond our understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and your minds in the true faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.